All right. Greetings, comrades. Um, here today with Tiana Okic, uh, who's based in London right now, originally from Sarajevo. Hi, Tiana. Welcome. Hi, Daniel. And hi, everyone. So um, Tiana just gave a kind of grand slam home run or whatever, really exciting um, presentation on Georg Lukács for uh, a conference we held on a extremely misunderstood book by the late uh, Marxist uh, Hungarian philosopher Lukács. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Lukács today. Um, well, what we want to do is sort of look at our present crises, plural crises, many crises, and ask, and I want to start off, Tiana, by asking you um, why it is so difficult to hold Marxist commitments in today's political climate, and 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 ultimately um, how one uh, does that. How how exactly? Uh, you know, maybe we could start with sort of what are these kind of common problems that we that we face when we want to remain in fidelity to a kind of Marxist position. It's extremely extremely difficult. Um, how, what's your what's your take? Uh, yeah, Daniel, um, 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 thank you for, for the question, which is, I think, very sort of vast and, 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 and really not easy to, um, not easy to think and, uh, even less easy to answer. But, um, you know, um, if, if you ask me personally, I think, um, that, you know, first, let me start with the joke. There is this, um, lecture, uh, by Badiou, where Badiou some, says, you know, oh, Negri told me that I'm not a Marxist. And I uh, uh, retorted that he isn't a communist, and that's worse. So uh, uh, you know, there is this, um, there is this kind of um, uh, obviously, the the idea: what does it mean to be a Marxist today? Uh, what does it mean to be a Marxist at the moment when Marxism more or less survives as an academic discipline? Um, in the moment when the uh, both the labor movement and you know the the Marxism as a movement, as it were, have 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 disappeared from from the historical scene, or have been uh, uh, severely defeated. One would say. So I think that's the first, you know, framework of 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 how we think about this. The second thing is, I think that you know, in the long run, um, the um, dilemmas of of our generation. Um, and when I say our generation, I mean people who are now in their uh, or going towards their 40s um, are to a large extent um, tragical dilemmas, that they are no longer dilemmas of a generation which lived the so-called boom of the welfare state, um, the dilemmas of the generation which were able you know, to have workplaces, safe pensions, more or less safe work, um, that were able to buy houses, that were able to um, start families, that were able to live a decent life. And I think increasingly the dilemmas of our generation are becoming tragical, not just on the level that, you know, uh, uh, unprecedented in human history that, you know, we are unable to found or, 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 or start families until our 40s almost, and not because as you know, the media wants to say that young people, for example, this is the discourse in, in, in huge parts of Europe, um, Italy, France, Eastern Europe, that the young people are lazy <laughs> and that they don't want to work uh, uh, rather than the conditions are really so dire and precarious and that people are unable to find employment, that employment is so precarious, that we are unable to leave our parents home until almost our 40s and this is i think for the first time in human history because if you think for example the generations of our grandparents who by the time they were 20 would have uh, a, a couple of children already is you know the the jump is quite quite severe um that's sort of like a general framework which i think is worth uh, uh keeping in mind the second um, point I would like to sort of mention related to these tragical dilemmas is obviously, um, you know, with increasing climate change uh, uh, emergency, with economy that is 
as it is uh, 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 in huge parts of the world with complete stagnation, um, with the um, 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 overnight, uh, you know, threats of the nuclear war, uh, the dilemmas that we face are quite, quite, quite different. And in the long run, I think that they are, that they are tragic. And in this sense, it is indeed very difficult to be a Marxist today. Um, it is difficult because, you know, it, it leads to all sorts of um, confusions, um, evasions, um, limitations, because at the, at the historical moment when our voice isn't heard or, you know, when it seems that we are talking into an empty space and everything that gets back is our own echo, it is very easy to um, allow oneself to be swollen, uh, uh, as it were, by despair and to say that the um, engagement is not worth, that it is impossible, that there is nothing that we can do which usually translates into some form of acquiescence, conformism, um, and the abandonment of the position altogether. And I think that this is a very um, um, unwelcoming uh, 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 sort of development, uh, which is, I think it's worth thinking again here uh, uh, with Lukács, who I personally see Lukács, for example, and Hobsbawm as two um, thinkers who share quite a lot and their dilemmas, for example, were tragical dilemmas um, of, of that generation. Uh, those were the dilemmas whether you stay within a movement, whether or not you personally disagree with Stalinism, but whether or not you abandon the movement or you remain faithful to it. So the option was either I say, like Lukács did, or you abandon the movement, which, for example, Korsh did. So um, it's not a small dilemma, which is why I think it's worth reminding ourselves of a um, Lukács's um, idea uh, 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 and something that he called lifelong passion. Uh, lifelong passion is, I think, quite a useful way of thinking about these problems. Um, it also implies, um, on the other hand, for example, you know, it comes to mind that uh, uh, you have similar kind of idea, for example, in Ben Said and his slow patience, uh, slow patience and lifelong commitment, which is very difficult, but it's the moment of, you know, um, um, deciding that um, you will remain within this movement and then what do you do precisely in the moment when your voice isn't heard and when it seems that everything that you are saying is met with no response. And I think thinking about the um, commitment in the form of a lifelong passion and what this means it's like the you know the moment you know that everyone knows that the matrix moment when you when 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 you say like this just stop you know it doesn't mean that the whirlwind doesn't continue the whirlwind continues but you have to be able to you know pause and stop in order precisely to try to relate the politics of the movement with everyday life and with certain um, both theoretical but primarily practical questions, because ultimately the question that the lifelong passion leads us to is the question of truth. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So academic Marxism is um, tragic as well because it has no uh, sort of palpable connection to the workers' movement and the added. Uh, uh, problem and the difference between Lukács' time and our own is the absence of of a workers' movement. But it's much worse than that because, to the extent that we speak of a kind of working class, the the left, the progressive left, the professional class, the academic Marxists have no uh, 
pipeline of communication or no compelling ideological relationship to that social class, generally speaking. And we can talk about social fragmentation and what Laclau talks about, the post-work society. Um, one thing I want to talk to you about is how we reconcile, how we make a bridge on this precise issue. And this brings us to the question of class struggle as such today. What What is your reading here? How, how in fact, can we uh, not... How do we how do we treat this problematic that Marxist fidelity, Marxist faith? I mean, I know Engels used uh, early, early in 1848 used the word of conversion. Um, and there is an element, obviously, in Western Marxism of the messianic. Um, of course, in the early 2000s, you had all of these philosophers from Agamben to Bedjou to Zizek looking at St. Paul and Thomas Munzer and the Soviet uh, historians were interested in saying, well, we can look at revolutions against in pre-capitalist times as, as kind of setting the ground for communist. Um, and of course, with that said, I am not wanting to think communism as a religion or anything like this. It's very problematic, I think, to do so. But what I hear you saying is that there does need to be a... Um, ideological question maybe of belief or of um faith what now I'm, I'm asking you a lot because you've made me so excited Diana, um to have this conversation with you so i guess my question let's start with the class struggle where are we at with this today let's start there uh again it is a very 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 complicated question because i think that if you look at obviously worldwide the um you know, the class struggle is very uneven. And obviously, um, there are periods and there are uh, countries and there are, you know, moments when the class struggle advances. And then there are obviously moments when the class struggle retreats, which are sort of interrelated, but obviously not necessarily. And I think, you know, the first question, the first thing which I personally think is quite relevant um, is, again, uh, uh, with Lukács, but not just with Lukács. And this relates to many of the things of uh, contemporary Marxism or, or Marxist theory or many of the Marxist schools or the schools within the Marxist, Marxist um, you know, thought, where the idea is more or less to say, which is sort of the Marxology, you know, the, the correct philological interpretation which is fine, it's obviously important, this is all relevant, the correct philological interpretation and all of this. But in many of these schools, which profess, as it were, the questions of Marxism to be reducible in some sense to the question of correct philological interpretation of Marx's work, seems to me that there is uh, not an implicit but explicit abandonment of what I personally think is central for Marxist theory. So let, let me say this, I, I'm not a person who believes in, you know, the coupure uh, epistemologique uh, uh, and various, uh, various similar things, um, at least not in this kind of absolute way. Um, and I think that returning a concept which has completely been obliviated from uh, public discussion, even from uh, great sections of Marxist theory within academic Marxism, uh, uh, you know, exactly psychoanalytically completely removed, and that is the concept of alienation, because I personally think that once you rid Marx or Marxism of the concept of the alienation, then there is no more Marx. Why, then, the question is posed, why fight this system? if you don't believe that the system inherently is what produces alienation, that the society that we live in, that is the capitalist society, if you don't believe that this society is false, if you don't believe that it produces falsity, if you don't believe that it is wrong at this level, in other words, that the society that we are living in is false, then why fight, you know, why struggle? Why anything? then, you know, you can just put your hands like this, surrender and, and, and abandon everything altogether. And I think 
you know, for better or for worse, uh, uh, um, if you look at the generation of the uh, uh, 68, for example, and the struggles that they've had, and the trajectories of many of the philosophers of, of 68, you will see that precisely because of this, uh, um, um, although to, to a large extent they did still believe in, 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 in alienation, although that was also at the same time a moment when alienation was gradually removed from, from, from the political discourse, from the philosophical discourse, from generally the concept of alienation had stopped being relevant. Whereas I think that the concept of alienation, which is, let's say, young Marx, and the concept of exploitation, which we are taught belongs to the late or mature Marx, I don't think that the two can be separated. And for example, the Italian economist Claudio Napoleoni was one of the one of the first people to argue that the two are actually cannot be thought separately because alienation is exploitation and exploitation is alienation. And I think I think that, you know, um, if anything, this is also something that is quite relevant for the, you know, very presuppositions of the class struggle today. This doesn't mean that obviously um, it is reducible to that. It doesn't mean that the class struggle is reducible to the concept of alienation, but it certainly has to depart from the premises that the society that we live in is false. And that the truth belongs only to the totality and that this falsity that we live belongs to the particularity. And in that sense, the aim personally as a philosopher and as well as someone who is aiming to foster class struggle is precisely to raise yourself above the particularity. And that is, I think, one of the crucial points. Now that there are recipes for class struggle, obviously it's, it's, there are no recipes. You know, there are no recipes for class struggle. Um, class struggle, as well as class consciousness, is extremely uneven. Um, there can be, uh, you know, uh, movement forward, there can be victories, but unless these victories are translated into something more permanent, they lead to even bigger defeats and disasters. And I think that these have been the lessons in the last 50 years in particular. So alienation is not evenly distributed. People are alienated by class in a, a kind of a, a not non-universal way. I think that there is, in fact, a tendency for some Marxists who deprivilege the early Marxist insights into alienation. And of course, we know for Lukács, it would be reification would be uh, his extension there. And we could talk about that maybe as a clarification for folks that are unfamiliar with Lukács, um, because I know we're invoking some names that people may not be familiar with. So we, I want to invite you to do that. But um, class consciousness has, since the 1960s, uh, because of the liberalizing tendencies of the new left, of you know consciousness raising and this kind of liberal progressive orientation to consciousness, has really ruined um, and, and rendered our understanding of class consciousness to be fundamentally ultra-liberal is what I would say. And how do you how do you kind of maybe restake a kind of uh, uh, a more coherent conception intellectually of of what we're talking about here? Um, even in a lot of like, say, Zizek's theory of ideology, he honestly, you know, is, in my opinion, um, trying to provide a critique of how consumer capitalism um, universally alienates the big other and this kind of um, fetishist disavowal. It makes a lot of sense as a kind of, but you know he can he can speak that language to any room of people, irrespective of their education, their class, and that's why Zizek has a certain um, popularity, and I think he should be credited for that. However, is there a different way of thinking about class consciousness that we could? experiment with maybe reintroducing that is maybe absent in today's discourse uh, again i think i think it's a very um it's 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 a very difficult question because um to think about you know the, the class and the class struggle and even the class consciousness if you want in the absence of a labor movement um, in the absence, if you want, of an organization, 
is a very ungratifying task, I think, because, um, as I said, um, you know, it, it's extremely uneven. And this means that, you know, even the temporary victory, if it's not generalized, then leads to, you know, despondence. It leads to um, overrating one's own experience. Uh, and, you know, we have seen with the philosophies of difference and the proliferation of the philosophies of difference, the proliferation of the philosophies of experience and and all of these things, which then substitute the particularity for the generality. And I think it's very difficult. So the, the question here is, again, um, at this particular moment, uh, uh, obviously, the task of any left is to... Um, well, to try to think what waging a class struggle today means, because on the one hand, long lasting passion also, in a way, means that for now, and Lukács says this, and it's it's very difficult to disagree with him. So he's writing this in 1970s. And um, there is a letter uh, uh, which he wrote to Lucien Goldman, where he says that for him, the task, the main task, you know, precisely upon accepting that it is about a long, lifelong passion, is in accepting, and Lukács says this is the main premise, that I don't want to participate in my own estrangement. I don't want to participate in my own alienation. And this is the, 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 the crucial point. The second point that he writes about, he says, so the long lasting passion also implies the idea that we accept that we have been defeated, uh, that we accept the idea that um, the um, uh, um, experience of the entire workers' movement does not... It, so the, the, the fact that we have been defeated does not mean that we reject all of this experience, the historical experience that we have, but that we work with this experience. But he says, seems to me, uh, uh, Lukács says, that rather than thinking that we are in the 1920s of the 20th century, so he's writing this in 71, I think, we should think having all this experience of the workers' movement behind us, but at the same time in front of us, we should think of ourselves as people who are actually in the first decades of the 19th century. In the first decades of the 19th century, it means in the decades when the work workers' movement is only beginning to gradually be formed. So this is Lukács' position, and it's very difficult to disagree with him. So the idea that we indeed are at a historical um, um, uh, um, conjuncture where we need to begin to think how to build this movement again as if it was gradually coming into being rather than taking it as a given because it isn't a given and and that's the lesson of the history that it isn't a given but that it requires um each and every time to be thought and rethought anew so it's quite interesting in 1971 that Lukács is saying with all this experience behind and ahead this is what we this is how we should behave because you know it also implies the long lasting passion or the slow patience of ben said it also implies that you do take a position but that this position cannot be a position that we have increasingly been led to believe that this ought to be the position of the left and this is a complete spontaneity, complete disorganization, uh, you know, seen in the uh, Lukács mentions, for example, the escalation, the word escalation in, in during the Cold War was the word, you know, the escalation. Uh, you can translate that into uh, uh, later trends that we've seen the event. So the left is constantly obsessed with the event. And so we jump from one event to, to another, from Yugoslav war to Iraq war, to Ukrainian war, to this war, to that, to, you know, we are constantly obsessed with, with, with jumping from one point to another. This is not to say that we are not supposed to do this, but it's the whirlwind that I was talking earlier. So you have to say, okay, you have to say this and then base your conception on some form of judgment without allowing that this is a judgment that is pre-constituted by 
what the system is telling you, if, mm. if it makes any sense. So this is, this is, I think, legitimate as, as a position for a socialist, because um, I think to be a Marxist, obviously, at least in my view, is, is not separable from being a socialist. So let's, let's, let's put these two things together. But at the same time, when you think about socialism, right? So w what is socialism? Socialism is the realization of socialist principles. And as such, socialism isn't reducible to union or to unions or to uh, uh, working class organization. It is the expression of this organization. It is the expression of its experience and of its history, but at the same time, isn't reducible to it. And I think it's very important to, to have this in mind uh, when we are constantly forced into these false choices, which are permanently conditioned by the complete madness of escalation, of event, of uh, difference, of subjective experience. And I think that this, well, by now we, 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 I think we should be free to call it the ideology of subjective experience and the fetishization of the difference has actually led us um, to where we are today. It has led us to um, basically say, right, we have to pause, we have to stop and we have to go back to basics. Yeah. It is not easy. It is not easy. And precisely because of this, the long-lasting passion, you know? Yeah, it's, Lukács is a godfather of what's called standpoint epistemology. And, you know, various uh, identity politics movements have, um, including feminist movements, have incorporated standpoint epistemology. And he's not necessarily the founder and contemporary social science has splintered that off into many different um views and things that we can talk about identity politics i think one of the challenges when we talk about identity politics as marxists is that we get accused of being vulgar that we d get accused of being you know deprivileging the suffering of of different forms of discrimination which in fact is actually the opposite this is actually like um we get scapegoated in that in that conversation so we have to um respect um the 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 success of the of the liberal um framework that is this kind of ubiquitous way of thinking about social suffering social strife social struggle is all individualized all even americanized and it's so overly pragmatic um and entrepreneurial and so on and so on and so on um i mean there is a school of thought and even some Hegelians in America, going back to uh, late uh, 1800s, recognized, and especially in the philosophy of John Dewey. And of course, Trotsky's conversations with Dewey are very important because one of the points that they disagreed on is the question of not the class struggle. I mean, Marx in a letter to a pr uh, Prussian uh, general who fought in the Union army against the Confederates named Weidemeyer, said, I did not discover class struggle. It's not my central idea. The bourgeois economists had discovered it before me. What I discovered was that the class struggle will lead to the dictatorship of the proletariat, and that there's a certain relationship between that political truth and history. And then you could speak about the question of teleology, which, you know, whatever. But that's the central issue, which was the matter between Dewey and Trotsky was on, on the liberal fear, the liberal hesitation of the empowerment, not to use a too liberal term, but the, the, the trust, I would say, of the workers' movement for its own liberation, for its own emancipation. And what we instead have is a kind of fragmentation of different localized multitude kind of struggles which do not cohere and are not trusted for their own radical advancement of their of their goals of their objectives so it's an extremely atomized situation and i guess my question to you now would be is it maybe important to bring back that old debate on dictatorship of proletariat even though the term uh is very um strong uh, on this channel here at zero books we've been having this conversation with a lot of our guests and so i want to 
I want to raise it with you. Um, Lukács had fidelity to this concept. And I think that the truth is, is that a Marxist position must have a, a strong connection to the soundness of that reality, that the class struggle is not enough. It's not enough just to affirm it. We need to go further than that. Do you agree? And what would you say? I mean, obviously, yes, in principle, I do agree. Uh, um, on the other hand, um, one need not be uh, Marx uh, or Lenin or Trotsky to realize that the times that we're living in are not revolutionary times. Uh, moreover, um, the times that we are living in, if anything, are exactly the opposite of any revolutionary uh, uh, times. Obviously, this doesn't mean, you know, um, take Lenin, you know, and Lenin's constant warning that, you know, um, the disaster, just like the revolution is always a possibility, so is a disaster. And at this particular moment, when the left appears and is uh, historically very weak, very, very weak, um, I think... Of course, the um, discourse uh, uh, about the um, uh, dictatorship of the proletariat is an essential part of what uh, a revolutionary or what a socialist politics is. Um, and as such, should not, you know, the left should not bow down and, 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 and say, fine, we, we reject this, uh, we reject this concept, uh, uh, it's irrelevant, it's obsolete. Of course, it's not obsolete. At this precise moment, um, I don't see how uh, uh, the um, um, the concept could be well not used. It, it it can obviously be used, and it can have a, a mobilizing potential, certainly for a minority. And I guess you know it's 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 educating the minority is also relevant. But at the same time, I think that you know. Um, um, it's important not to give up on it precisely because there is a, you know, there is a belief um, that going with the current will make things easier. Whereas the obvious answer is no, going along with the current won't make things easier. Well, that, anything... that, 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 thank you, because isn't the question of class consciousness also about creating points of um, points of difference that would sort of exit us from the cave of pure difference uh, to, to sort of phrase it that way. I don't know if that makes sense to you. In other words, um, actually, uh, politics is about um, decisions and uh, where we stand. And there are um, differences that that there are consequences that come from holding a Marxist view. I mean, um, in fact, to be a Marxist, actually, you you have a measure of, of, of what that means by um, the fact that it, it actually should never be construed as a kind of moderate or center or kind of, it's a dangerous position to hold. And it, you, you have to have that um, reality as part of it. And I think that um, we uh, in the American left, because we have had a um, really a, 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 the militancy of our history of socialism is far past, like it's some people say prior, really in the pre uh, of world war one period was when it was most radical um then you have the new left that's a different uh, animal but so so i guess my question there is sort of maybe it's important to create a kind of um a, a throw a series of questions down on where we stand on certain issues and i know that um that itself is alienating for a lot of people and that actually draws me to this big debate we're having about the status of the professional managerial class been going on for many decades. It's heightened uh, since Trump came into power. And there's been a lot of folks, Jacobin Magazine, the Democratic Socialists of America, a lot of folks, you see this especially after the Bernie Sanders movement, are recognizing that interior to our generation, one way that you see the intensification of class antagonisms is in this new stratification of professional managerial class issues and kind of dynamics. And much of them are kind of um, sort of uh, microaggressions and kind of small differences, which are actually representative of much larger ideological differences. So therefore, if you want to talk about class struggle, you almost want to say, well, 
we have these kind of uh, in intra generational intra class issues how do we kind of bring them out and it's not easy to do it's not easy to do because even the working class there is a certain sense of social mobility so many people from the working class enter into this pmc maybe they're on the lower strata of the pmc but they're still a part of it yeah and they're a part of it without any labor or union protections so they speak as an atomized entrepreneur within this kind of thing which itself is classed i want to ask you for your own experience what is your view on this how what is the sort of proper handling of the pmc question because you can also run into a danger of what kind of christopher lash did which is to center all of your politics in this kind of machiavellian conception of power where it's all about the elites and then you run the danger of a very vulgar class conception which is ideologically anyone who has kind of any solidarity with the elites in some way is rendered canceled or rendered an enemy so it creates a i would call a kind of hystericization of politics so how do you how do you treat the pmc question well i think uh obviously i i as i said you know the 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 left and the state of the left uh, uh, is quite different in different parts of the world. Uh, whereas, you know, I can see that this is a question and obviously it is a question in uh, uh, America, in huge parts of the Western Europe. But I would like to go back to, to you know, some more recent examples of the, the left and some of the successes. So, for example, and it also relates to what I was saying earlier about the, um, you know, um, um, uh, these victories if they're not generalized then they lead to um 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 despondence they lead to uh, uh, uh the idea that your own position is wrong although you know that your position is right and hence it leads to you know all sorts of uh, uh, uh defeatist as it were elements i think for many people in europe uh, uh, uh um the experience of syriza was actually quite quite fundamental and foundational and one shouldn't forget that you know syriza didn't come overnight that it's a result of decades of 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 the work of the left of the unions that you know we had you know uh, more general strikes than in 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 the last you know the, the greece in those 10 15 years 20 30 had more general strikes than uh, uh um well, many countries combined in their total history, for example, you know. So I think it's quite important when you think about these things, you know, and this was the expression of one political moment, of one political conjuncture, at, and of a long-lasting struggles on the left. And this, as always, is the problem with the left, that it, you know, it takes decades to make a breakthrough, and then it takes one choice to completely destroy the decades of the struggle behind and what we are seeing in greece there is still you know uh, uh, there is still a lot of resistance and if you've been following for example what's been happening with with the uh, trials to the golden dawn the uh, greece neo-nazi group you know the mobilizations on the street, street of athens were still quite huge and quite large on the other hand if you look at for example the uh, the example of podemos in spain um which in no way can be compared to Syriza. I mean, in 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 broadly it can, of course. But um, if you look at the way that uh, uh, Podemos ended up, what they've actually done, they've you know there was there was a movement in Spain. There was a real movement. They were able to um, they were able to generalize, as it were, the demands of this movement, and very soon to sell out. Which means uh, 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 that. You know, they have, um, I've recently read an interview with uh, uh, um, uh, some people on the Spanish left, and it's now a general consensus that they've actually pushed the Spanish left decades behind from where they were when the square protests and organizations and movements and everything started. So this is, I think, very important if we want to think about these things. So, yeah. yes, obviously, there is a there is a problem. Uh, but as you said, I, 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 I completely agree. And I think it's very wrong to um, limit your sort of class perspective um, uh, on the concept of the elite. You know, 
us versus them, uh, uh, 99 versus 1% and yeah. similar kinds of populist slogans, mm -hmm. which in the long run um, even can, and in many cases do, force you to make compromises with the forces that no left should make compromise yeah. with. For yeah. example, in the Balkans, it would mean compromises with the nationalists. Uh, it would mean uh, 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 compromises with the status quo, in other words. Yeah. And this is where this kind of this kind of politics leads you to. So I think well, it's very yeah. wrong to. Uh, I understand, you know, in, in America, you've had the, the so-called Bernie moment, and Bernie moment was very much premised on on this kind of uh, uh, polarization and on. You know, it's also, one shouldn't underestimate, it's also an expression of a wider discontent of the people, and this is always the problem. But the problem is that this wider discontent was, it was falsely believed that it can be solved by the Democratic Party. Right. That is, via the socialist in the Democratic Party, which is quite different to socialist to court, if, 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 if you know mm -hmm. what I mean. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. that's exactly the yeah. belief that going with the current, that is that the socialists within Democratic Party is the same as socialists to court is quite false, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think it has yeah. already costed American left quite a lot. I'm wondering about the relationship between social fragmentation, uh, crises, and these kind of uh, post-welfare state dynamics that create fragility and this kind of individualized you know precarity and we kind of go in this cocoon and we kind of have this uh, sensitivity and even cancel culture is a part of that i'm thinking about that context and alienation for example okay 99 percent against the one percent doesn't really properly alienate the left-wing activist in the same way that even Western Maoism did, because what did Western Maoism do for the professionals? Western Maoism said, go into the factories, don't go to the university and become a professor. So go into the factories and raise the raise the consciousness with the workers. I'm sorry to say you can have your problems with Maoism, but it would be nice if people actually thought more along those lines today. Um, in other words, the ideology that we have of our demands of how we can how we are presenting this struggle. I'm sorry to say it needs to properly alienate people along class lines. And I, I wonder, Tiana, if people are kind of maybe uh, prepared for that or if how do you how do you sort of how do you sort of make that case that actually um, you need to abandon some of these kind of privileged discourse frameworks that you're using and you need to make a shift and to see things differently a and then b present the the platform to the people differently um because i agree that the occupy ad busters was very gen x it was it was too in a way it was too easy to to say that in a way it, capitalism is not reducible to some feudal thing of just a few oligarchs you know i mean i know that varoufakis says well capitalism may be dead but for the majority of the people, it's it's not like that. Um, so I don't know if there, there's a question in there. I guess it's it's maybe a question of slogan or sort of you know how do you how do you message a kind of struggle, a, t a terminology of struggle that would actually be um, that would show a path of I don't know kind of dealing with alienation in a way that would be more robust than these what we might call left populist ways have done, which all became sucked up into the neoliberal parliamentary um, cave and they they disappeared from Sanders to Syriza to Podemos. So maybe, yeah, there's that question. And then I also want to ask you about what in Marxist people are talking today in Marxist circles of substitutes for the proletariat. And then that raises the question also of lumpen proletariat today. But let's go back to this question of, yeah, like, how do you get out maybe of the populist terminology of framing the struggle, if that makes sense? Yeah, it does. It does make sense. I mean, uh, I, I, I don't have a straightforward answer. And, um, you know, um, usually um, um, the experience of, of, of someone who has been on the left for quite some time, you know, um, 
usually when the questions uh, uh, which uh, even uh, uh, mildly resemble the question what is to be done are posed it means that there is something utterly wrong because if we knew you know the answer to uh, to this question uh, uh, and if we could just put it on straightforward but no the only answer is the struggle because only through struggle can people emancipate themselves and the conditions that they live in. This poses also the question of solidarity. And I think the question of solidarity today, it's, it's, it's vital to discuss it because in the age of cancelling and cancel culture, the solidarity as, um, um, you know, you will read many discussions, theoretical discussions about what solidarity is, but the question is actually very practical. It's a very concrete question. It's, it's, it is a question of living that rather than theorizing that. So it's obviously not easy and it's not easy precisely because uh, not just because on the other on the other side of the spectrum, you have, um, you know, people who are exposed to uh, uh, um, um, uh, right wing ideologies, uh, people who are uh, exposed to fake news, who are exposed to various conspiracy theories and all of these things, which um, um, I've said this many times, but I think it should be repeated, you know, people should not be blamed for believing these things. You know, um, people have been abandoned to themselves for uh, uh, for decades now. And when you have a complete retraction, as it were, and the abandonment by the state, whatever we want to think, I mean, the state is another huge problem in this debate. It's like the elephant in the room that we, we, we don't talk about and that we should be talking about. But however marginal, uh, uh, um, in particular, uh, um, my you know knowledge would be related more to European context and 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 everything. However, uh, um, marginal today the, the the welfare state looks to us and non-existent. We do have to understand that at one point the welfare state was actually quite crucial, and it was crucial not just in um, 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 maintaining a certain level. Of, of 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 life, but actually as a um, as an element which was directly engaged uh, in the class struggle, not that it it fostered the class struggle, but yeah. that it was yeah. there to, to 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 maintain the status quo. Oh, yeah. and I think these are all very sort of relevant things that we don't talk about. Yeah. What does it mean that the conditions of our reproduction and i do mean that for marxists you know rather than going to these slogans the thing is that we need to discuss the very basic yeah very basic conception and that is yeah. the relationship uh, uh um of the uh the position of you know the worker on the one hand as a citizen on the other hand as a wage laborer and the contradiction that exists between these two things mm -hmm. formally equal parties that enter on the one hand into into a wage contract into mm -hmm. a labor contract and on the other hand you know the the the, the individual as a citizen yeah it would appear, and this is, you know, why certain ideas have been very sort of attractive for some people on the left, the idea that with parliamentary politics, we will be able to change these things. Although the parliamentary politics does not bring into question this fundamental division, which enables the um, exploitation, and that is the division between the state and the civil society. Mm. And I think that this is... Uh, again and again and again and time again, what Marxists should insist upon. Mm. I think it's obviously easy and that we think that, you know, um, having slogans um, will bring precisely the movement towards you. And I think it's part of the what I was earlier talking about as shortcuts. Yeah. So this is one of the shortcuts that we that, you know, we're convinced that this will bring more people towards the movement, that this will bring bigger success, uh, instant success, you know, because today everything is instant, so that the success will come naturally, whereas nothing comes naturally, yeah. you know. It, it only comes via and through the struggle. It's very difficult to wage, obviously, a class struggle in the moment when you have the biggest world corporation, that is the Amazon, uh, 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 the corporation which doesn't even allow unionization to its mm -hmm. workers. Mm -hmm. So there, there is a space for the left. It's not that these workers don't understand that they're being oppressed and that they can't go and we and that they have to, you know, yeah. that they're super exploited. And it's one of the things that you learn, for example, you know, the examples 
again, we don't listen to each other quite a lot. And there isn't, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, the ways that we even possibly conceive of internationalism today have changed significantly. But, you know, when you talk about the, um, for example, with the workers uh, uh, in Eastern Europe, whose factories have been privatized and the privatization of our lives is an essential aspect of the um, 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 expansion of capitalism into new spaces, you know, and this also leads to the uh, privatization of reproduction. Mm. This is a very, very crucial point because mm -hmm. all previous modes of production, as it were, if, you, if, 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 if this is what we want to use, have been based on communal you know, production and reproduction was communal. Here we have, and this is also with the advent of the state, uh, which intervenes between uh, 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 the wage labor, uh, so as, 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 as a mediating party between the wage labor, between that contract on the one hand and the capital on the other. Mm. So, you know, the, the problems are very much, very, very complex. If yeah. you look at the United States, for example, and it's very difficult to disagree. For example, Jameson, who I think is a Marxist that we, you know, don't read enough. That's that's my sort of impression sometimes. Uh, he has this interesting sort of text on, on Walmart. Mm. Walmart is the source of all misery of American people always lowering the salaries, always maintaining the inflation down so that the poorest Americans can buy there, but they can only buy precisely because the Walmart is doing all these other things, mm -hmm. you know, and the East and the West, you know, there are, the, there are differences. Yeah. Because um, the, um, the, the capitalism in the West is by now related, that is the power of the capital is related to the distribution rather than production. Yeah. In some other parts of the world, you can talk about the centrality of the production still. Uh, but certainly, I'm not quite certain that in the United States, uh, you know, the concentration is related that much to production. It is rather yeah. the distribution, the logistics and all of these things. And if you look at the COVID pandemic, for example, the fact that the... Um, 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 the vaccine was produced, but I mean, uh, the, the union between the German producer and the American logistics firm tells you quite a lot that you need to know. The Germans had to unite with the Americans precisely because they didn't have the distribution points. Mm -hmm. you know, because mm -hmm. the Americans owned the logistics, the distribution behind it. And that's the story of one of the vaccines, at least. Mm. You know, the relations are much more complex than yeah. simply than simply stating any of these things. And I think, you know, when you think about the thinking about reproduction, thinking about the family, uh, on the one hand, you know, the commodification. So the labor, the laborer or the wage worker as a commodity versus the citizen. And on the other hand, you know, this also leads to the split between the family and the reproduction. And these are, you know, quite relevant things, uh, mm -hmm. uh, which. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I mean, I think I, I OK, like, you know, it's not. It's not so much what is a better slogan for the left. I. I, I think that I, I. I wasn't meaning to to suggest that this is our task. And I think that the the deeper question is one of political education. And in the American context, one uh, avenue by which some left leftists and socialists are trying to do that is to kind of you know introduce a sense in which people see their life from the lens not only of an understanding of the kind of uh, metaphysics of capital or the kind of you know the structure of power and things like this i mean i think one of the unfortunate uh legacies of academic marxism is to see power in everything and that's actually become uh, a problem um which we can talk about and of course michel foucault and some vulgar foucauldian readings are responsible for that um however you know there's also another avenue by which people think about class as a kind of bourgeoist, Pierre Bourdieu, which is really a kind of focus on the kind of working poor and the kind of, you know, the 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 um, the degradation of of what uh, uh, life is like. And of course, Engels was um, and E.P. Thompson and Hobsbawm and many Marxists are concerned with the true um pauperization and that kind of dickinsonian experience of class and i feel that sometimes academic marxism or maybe 
all the time, or let's say a lot of the time, doesn't have anything to say about the suffering of the working class. And I personally am interested in having that conversation, but having that conversation well, how do you have that conversation properly? Instead of just saying, well, yeah, we're all evenly, I mean, yeah, even the people on succession, even the 1%, they're alienated just like you. And that's what capital is. It's just ultra alienation. So, you know, that's it. Okay, fine. Case closed. <laughs> Well, no, actually, the so you, no, I agree with you. I mean, the fact but, but it's hard to do that because then you talk you talk about a dialogue or a discourse on um, it's Rancier, it's Jacques Rancier. His his idea is that politics emerges when you find the point in society where the wrong is not accepted as a wrong from the powers that be. And I'm sorry to say, Tiana, I think that the working class experience is an example of that. The working class experience and the legitimacy of its suffering is not permitted to be qualified as an eligible wrong. And then we have a problem because then the only mode by which we can talk about that wrong is through the discourse of personal identity. And then it becomes that, you know, that kind of thing. And it bothers me. I mean, it, it it it's a it's a tricky question because l l maybe we could start by asking you your opinion on the framework of Pierre Bourdieu himself. Um, there's been some interesting work trying to say, look, actually, he, his framework can be incorporated with Marxism. I wonder if you agree with that out of curiosity, and maybe we could explain a little bit if you don't mind. Uh, about his orientation well I, I i personally am not not convinced that it can and i'm neither convinced that it it, it it can't if that makes any sense um yes i think obviously there is there is there is a sense why i i would rather than bordieu you know i would be more inclined to um for example in america what loic vacan did for example uh, and the sociologists of his for example stripe you know the trilogy punishing the poor and the uh, prison industrial complex and all of these things that we see that we see merging which are directly related to targeting uh, really the poorest of the poor and i think if there is one thing um, that can sort of be useful and obviously is useful for the um, uh, discussions on the left and even in the United States is the discussions that we've had in particular in the last two years, uh, uh, um, which have um, resulted from obviously uh, uh, um, yet again, you know, terrorizing treatment of African-Americans. Um, and I think that these discussions are obviously necessary and I think that they are quite relevant. And I think that, yes, um, in 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 um, uh, large parts of the world, obviously America has its own specificities as a country in terms of the both internal and external politics, and 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 I think that this is also, you know, part of the reason why it indeed has become the world empire in some sense, you know, and that there are certain specificities that we 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 can say are characteristic of the American society, but on the other hand, it is. Um, prevalent and everywhere, you know, since the um, uh, coming of the age of austerity. And let me just say that the working class, even before we've had the term austerity, has been exposed to um, austerity, to humiliations, to degradations, and has bore the brunt of the development of the fine Western world that whose you know, whose um, progress and whose successes and whose commodities we all enjoy, you know. So the only commodity that isn't produced in the process of production directly, that is the human being, has bore the brunt of huge, tremendous, unthinkable progress that we've seen in the last 50 years whilst at the same time being punished for that. So in that sense... Yes, of course, you can include Bourdieu, you can include, you know, there there have been discussions in sociology, you know, 70s, 80s, a lot of discussions about the, the class, the um, uh, what does the class mean today, how do you even calculate the class, but I think that the approaches which take this uh, idea that, you know, you can simply determine a class by 
some mathematical quantitative <laughs> quantitative method are uh, are wrong um, and is not something that the left should. Uh, and you you see you see the Bourdieuist framework as kind of reducing the question of class is kind of like income or something. I mean, they, they don't really say that because he uses different categories. He uses the, um, well, precisely, he uses this notion of symbolic capital and how symbolic capital creates a field for which people kind of uh, gravitate. And there's a kind of ideological mechanism that, that uh, kind of keeps class. So it's, it's, it's more sophisticated than that. But a well, lot I didn't people, say that. That's what that's what he no, was but, doing. No, 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 but I, but I do, I do think. No, but I do. Oh no, no, but I do think that a lot of people that take on a sociological conception of class end up vulgarizing class as this kind of quantitative or kind of yeah, basically class is kind of income when when that's not really what class is at all. So I just wanted to say that. No, I completely, I completely agree with you. Um, on the other hand, um, I think. Yeah, there is a potential to, you know, the, um, the, the 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 symbolic, as it were, and the ideological and and other Bourdieuian elements, uh, uh, which are, you know, obviously important. But then again, I don't think that this can. I mean, it can, but I'm not. I, I'm, I'm. I see limitations, limitations in this, because again, I would go to the. Um, you know, to the question, to the philosophical question, and that is the question of the that is the question of the truth. So, will yes, there is some truth in that. On the other hand, the um, 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 realization of this again can only come through a struggle. And I know that this, you know, sounds quite um, 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 crude in some sense. But on the other hand, um, the realization of the class can only come through the struggle. And this is, I think, the, yeah. you know. And it's very interesting to look at Pierre Bourdieu's debates with Franz Fanon. Uh, you may be familiar with this, but they debated the Algerian struggle, whereas Fanon says the liberation of the Algerian people has to center the lumpen proletariat, uh, peasantry, etc., within uh, that context. And Bourdieu was way too, was extremely opposed to that conception. Um, and not, not that he was racist per se but actually it, it it does raise an interesting question which i wanted to talk to you about is sort of you know contemporary marxists want to find a substitute for the traditional working class factory working class in the neoliberal era and people of Baju and zizek have the notion of the nomadic proletariat which is this kind of precariat immigrant refugee kind of uh, fluid class which uh, may may possess a revolutionary potential. Well, I'm that. very critical. I'm very critical of those precisely yeah. because, um, you know, not just um, in, in, in any historicist sense and that you go to the origins of this nomadic, what is nomadic, but I think, um, you know, one thing that, you know, is, is, is sort of emerging and I think it's, 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 it's quite relevant. Obviously there are people on the left who have been saying this, you know, all along, but I think, you know, if you think, that the alienation and exploitation, as I said, are two concepts that have to be thought together and that they are inseparable, which I think that they indeed are. Um, I think if one would go back and then if as Marxists we would do, uh, uh, because in the end, you know, there is one political economy, there isn't politics on the one hand, for Marx at least, you know, there isn't politics here and then economy here, but it's political economy. He calls it the critique of political economy, not without reason. Uh, if we went back, and I've had this debate with a friend of mine recently, uh, I was criticizing Donna Haraway and, you know, the cyborg, the cyborg subject, uh, you know, post-human feminism and 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 uh, uh, the things that we are seeing sort of proliferate today, which are kind of, you know, go along with the accelerationist um, uh, um, uh, line, at least in my view. And we've had debates and then she was like, yeah, but I like this text. Um, I like her text, you know, uh, the sandpoint theory feminism. And I think it's fine at that particular moment that but again we have to see the 80s as extremely backward years if you want um, um i think that the theoretical production well at least of certain sections which you know 
we today see as the left and 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 are celebrated. Uh, uh, this is not to say I'm not saying that Donna Haraway is a reactionary in, in no way. It's just that I think that there are certain uh, that there are reasons why the left should actually think about the political economy of this period and what this you know if you take. Allah Hegel, that philosophy is the expression of its own time and thoughts, that we need to wonder what was this time? What, what was expressed there? If you think Deleuze, Gattari, Donna Haraway, and, you know, I often make jokes, uh, 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 you know, that Donna Haraway is basically contemporaneous with the Terminator, and we know how the Terminator ends, you know. Um, so I think it's kind of important to think uh, in these terms, uh, uh, to think about the political economy of this time and to think about this philosophy as an expression of a certain period. Now, I'm not saying that everyone within this period can be put in the same bracket. I'm just yeah. saying that we need a more attentive analysis of the um, uh, um, of the political economy, because it seems to me that precisely uh, there's the text by Nancy Fraser. I mean, I, 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 I about the feminism, capitalism, and the cunning of history, which is, you know, it's very good, but on the one hand, on the other hand, that is, it's very problematic because she cancels the entire East and says, you know, there was no feminism in the East as if uh, a thing which I completely sort of uh, uh, dislike in this text. But nonetheless, she's quite right to point that even the feminists in the precise moment, she says, when the circumstances, when everything that was happening was telling us that we need a deepened and deeper analysis of political economy, we actually focused on the identity, the standpoint theory, the um, the idea that, you know, um, 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 subjective experience can somehow um, substitute for the objectivity of historical processes and that this particularity of the subjective position of being a woman, I don't know, um, black African woman in America or African women from Africa or Chinese woman from China or Bosnian woman from Bosnia or Muslim from Bosnia or, uh, uh, you know, a series of differentiations which you can make ad infinitum, that this would somehow help us uh, understand things better. And I think that this, she, she's, she has a point there. So at the precise moment when the circumstances were telling us that we need the analysis of political economy, rather than the analysis of political economy, what we focused on were debates about identity. And if you think about this in terms of the um, its own time apprehended in thought, then there is a political economy of this period to be done by Marxists. There is a space for thinking uh, 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 what this all meant, and moreover, what it all means today, because this is precisely what we have, in a way, inherited. Yeah, I mean, the identity piece is is, is tricky and important, and one way that socialists need to, I think, navigate it is to show that the uh, that there isn't an a alternative way for advocating emancipation which would be more thorough and which would not get caught in the stranglehold of the liberal powers that be and that in fact the 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 identity politics has a problem precisely at that uh point and we've seen this so many times that um it's it's self-evident and so uh but then we have this uh intra-class debate which again takes us back to the experience of class in the sense that in the American left, actually the liberal progressives want to say something like, no, no, no. Um, we decide the terms of what sort of social wrongs, social sufferings are legit. So it becomes this very strange, passive aggressive debate internal to the PMC. And it's frankly, and we've seen several examples of this debate, and I actually am going to suggest that the future portends many future debates about this issue. And I think that the socialist left needs to be quite um, robust on this point, uh, which is that the um, standpoint of the revolutionary proletariat, if we want to say that, is actually a standpoint that is worth reintroducing. Because I think one problem is, is that which is why I'm so interested in what I call worldview Marxism, which is, yes, we do need a bit of standpoint, but we need to link it imminently to the 
um, power dynamics of capitalist exploitation and alienation that we experience in the real world, not these kind of essential kind of immutable Aristotelian categories that end up reproducing a kind of weird return to social Darwinism in a weird way. Um, and that in so doing, we're going to achieve the emancipation of racialized populations and subaltern populations more adequately, more adequately. And, um, and we're more serious than they are about that. We want that emancipation more robustly and more universally than, than it's currently on offer. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, the, the point that I, that I made, I, not that I think quite the opposite, not that I think that identities are not important and not that I think that, you know, um, um, that they are politically irrelevant, quite the opposite, because yeah. precisely because what the um, 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 incredible differentiation and proliferation of uh, uh, um, uh, new identity. So it's, you know, it's not just racial identity. There are identities upon identities. But what this shows is the absolute power of the capital and capitalism as a system to, to respond, to be so malleable, to be so um, incredibly stretchy. And it's the stretchiest of all systems that, the you know, that the, 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 the human uh, civilizations have ever seen. And it is precisely to question everything and to put everything at this. So everything becomes a possibility to discuss within the identity politics. So from, you know, the society for of the lovers of snakes, the society of the lovers of marine turtles, the society of the lovers, you know, it just becomes immense, immense, immense line, leaving, however, behind the only thing that it actually sort of does not show, and that is the power of the capital. So everything can be dissolved. Everything can be transformed. Everything can be brought into question. Every difference can be put forward. Anything can be indeed a subject of particular discussion, whereas the capital's universal power of generating the flux of the capital remains absent. And this is, I think, what the left needs to learn. Not to say that the identities are irrelevant, because obviously, again, there are different, um, and there are differences in, um, uh, as I said, internal and external politics. So the, the um, the struggles within United States and the um, challenges that the left faces are certainly different to challenges that the left in Germany now, for example, faces. I mean, yes, they share they share certain <laughs> premises, they share, share certain similarities. They also will depend on the way that we conceive internationalism today, globally. You know, what is internationalism today? I want to uh, ask you about the political as a concept. I always feel uh, through the back door when I hear the concept of the political in scare quotes, I think of Heidegger and I think of Schmidt and their insidious uh, legacy on the left. And a lot of thinkers um, have uh, put forward the notion that really the political is this rare moment that emerges. And this is why you have, you know, the theory of the event and things like this. Okay. And you made a nice clarification a moment ago that actually Marx combines politics and economy. It's good to do. It's easy to do that in theory. What at the same time, and you have this notion in Esposito and other thinkers of the im political. Can you just kind of break down some of these debates about the political and where do you fall in these debates? Uh, first, I will answer the last question. I don't fall in these debates. Uh, that's uh, that's my sort of simple answer. Um, as for the political, for example, um, you know, in Schmittian terms, and I think Esposito is uh, uh, quite clear that um, um, the political is any or every relationship that is defined by the friend enemy opposition that is the only political relationship for schmidt and the rest is impolitical as it were so uh um i don't think that these are um i personally think 
think that the Schmittian and more generally the political theology debate is actually a metaphysical debate. So in that sense, I am completely, um, 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 I'm completely against, against what you, it. What do you, what do you mean? Can you, can you elaborate? Because there is, there, there is, there is a, um, um, uh, you know, ultimately the decision is a metaphysical act. It's Deus ex machina. It can't be, it can't be explained. There is no explanation. There is a, uh, 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 which is why they call it political theology in in, in a way. So uh, uh, it, it is a metaphysical theory par excellence, which is, uh, uh, you know, it, it has this vest of being some political theory and the theory which explains the political relationships and so on and so forth, whereas it's, it's actually pure metaphysics. And for this reason, it is to be rejected to core, you know. Uh, it is to be rejected. Um, I know that it's not that easy, and I know that huge parts of the left have, in particular in Italy, for example, have been actually um, drawn towards this, and, you know, they have substituted, as Mario Tronti says somewhere, you know, they have substituted Karl with Karl, so Karl with a K, with Karl with a C, uh, uh, which is Marx for Schmidt. Um, I don't think that this is a... Um, um, a good, um, uh, nor do I think that it has brought any um, any concrete sort of victories for the left. Uh, quite the opposite, it has pushed the left more towards the, um, um, you know, um, spontaneism in 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 one form or or another. Uh, but it's not just my personal sort of belief. Um, uh, you know, political. Um, metaphysical concept, I would rather focus, I would rather see the left focus on politics uh, rather than uh, political as this yeah. uh, some sort of uh, uh, um, you know, there is this there is this idea that, you know, the um, the, the, the secret, secretive language that if you use these, these magical words that you're somehow, you know um, brilliant, genius that mm -hmm. The, the, the magic contains within itself, you know, something. Well, I, 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 well, I let just... me let me give you let me give you a um, not not pushback, but let me give you a counter uh, view, which is OK. We started this conversation with the idea that you you have to have a kind of faith in Marxism for the long term and a kind of optimism, let's say. Well, you know, uh, today people become a Marxist by participating in concrete events. I mean, let's take the Black Lives Matter uprising. I know that there are thousands of, of youth in America that went to the streets and they had a conversion to radicalism. Same goes with Trump in the opposite direction because Trump radicalized them showing, oh my God, how is it heavenly imaginable that some wild, absurd thing like Donald Trump could come into power? this system it's a proof that this system is messed up so events introduce the political okay but they don't enter us into some mystical ontological you know uh, uh, uh we're not seized in that way i kind of hear that i kind of hear you saying that but how then do you account for the fact that events do seize us and in the narratives and the bi biographies that we all have of what politics means to us where <laughs> we relate them back to these moments so how do you make sense of that uh okay it's not an easy question um obviously i think again let me go back to the concept of lifelong passion because as, as as a true hegelian i think that only only from at the end of the life can you see uh what a certain process was yes it is true that we are all formed by certain events it is true that some of us uh remain or will remain faithful to the idea it's true that for some this is just a tad a fad fashion that this is you know something that will pass it's you know it happened just like the logic of the event imposes this um and i'm glad that you've mentioned the question of the youth uh, which is it, it is a quite important question and again i would reply to that yes obviously the left has always been you know you have Fichte, I think, for the first time, who introduces the uh, the idea of the youth and the importance of the youth. And if you look at the um, 
for example, what comes to mind to me, at least the members of the so-called Mlada Bosna, the uh, young Bosna, the um, uh, revolutionary organization uh, whose one of the members uh, uh, had killed the um, Duke Franz Ferdinand and, you know, the beginning of the First World War and so on and so forth. They were very young. And Hobsbawm also writes somewhere that the revolution is a, um, how can I put it, is a work of young people, you know, um, because uh, you know how the story goes. As young, we are idealists and we want to change the world. And then as we get older or grow older, we change. Uh, and people who were often who were on the left when they were young would be at the center or even on the right when they're old and so on and so forth, which is why I think that, you know, one shouldn't be fascinated with the youth is what I'm saying. Uh, one should rather think about and for the lifelong passion rather than the youth, in particular because we also live in an unprecedented historical moment where um, all cultures and civilizations, more or less, uh, that is until ours and the moment that we are living in, have in one way or another respected the old people. They were the voice of the wisdom. They were the people who were respected. They were the people who you would go and seek an advice. They were the people who had more experience. Um, in today's world, they are the people who are increasingly being hidden in home care homes. They are the people that we um, um, have a certain social, um, how can I put it, um, shame, you know, it is a shame to be an old person today. Whereas I think passion belongs equally to young people, to old people and to middle-aged people. And I think that the culture that we're living in and, you know, it's, it's we're increasingly um, hiding the old age because it is a shame to be old. You have to go to plastic surgeries. You have to, you know, when you're 60, you're supposed to look like you're 31. Um, and there is this cult of youth, uh, and I'm talking now about the West. Um, if you think about the former communist societies, the Eastern Bloc, including the Yugoslavia, which was never part of the Warsaw Pact, but nonetheless, let's say, was considered, uh, there was a cult of the youth, you know, the youth was, why? Because this project, the communist project, the, 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 the was turned towards the future. You know, its telos was in the future. Um, whereas today, what I see, and in that sense, you could say that the communist movements were heirs of enlightenment. Whereas today we're seeing a, some kind or some form of twisted enlightenment. If that makes any sense, there is a an incredible um, social shaming of being old and old people, whilst at the same time there is a cult of youth, but it's not a youth that is oriented towards the future, but towards the eternal presentism, towards the eternal present, because there isn't anything else but this present, mm -hmm. which is why, not that I think that youth, youth isn't relevant, but I think, uh, 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 and obviously, you know, historically things change and have been changing and you know from revolutions which were made by very young people i'm not saying lenin wasn't very young but you know that the tendentially this has been the trend but nonetheless i think to fetishize the youth yeah. is actually very 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 wrong which is why i think that this um uh, idea of a lo lifelong passion or slow yeah. patience is actually uh, relevant as ever rather than you know Yes, we are all, you know, everyone has their own moment which politicize them. I would rather talk about moments that politicize us than the events that 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 change us, because I think it's, as I said at the beginning, it's very dangerous and it's very wrong for the left because it leaves you in a position where you're constantly reactive to this escalation, to that escalation, to this event, to that event, and you are constantly right. having to jump rather mm -hmm. than saying, mm -hmm. okay, the whirlwind might continue, but, you know, what is my judgment on this? Mm -hmm. 
beautiful. No, I, I really appreciate that. And it shows the way that contemporary capitalism has erased. And I've written, actually just published a book about this issue, um, what I call the crisis of initiation, which is another term of the absence of what it means to be an adult. It's very interesting if you look at civil society organizations that that define the age by which people become technically an adult in the eyes of social authority. Did you know, are you aware that it, it, it increases? Now it's like you're 40, you're an adult, right? What the fuck? What is this? Like, what? What? <laughs> I mean, it's 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 yeah. Of course, never before in 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 the history of human civilization, yeah. Would you know? Would you think that only with forty you are an adult? You well, know? this is this is why Agamben was so interested in infancy and the uh, the fact that today, actually, this is some of the best stuff of Agamben that that he shows that uh, this um, stunting of subjectivity uh, has a. Kind of this historical genealogy to that you can kind of go back and, and piece together and the frankfurt school is also good on this uh they link it to the um uh, the question of um trauma and traumatization and psychoanalysis There's yeah eric from i mean you know there have been people who have uh, 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 I, I I used to read a lot of from when I was uh, yeah. when I was younger, for example, and you know yeah. it was it was also a mark of that time. But you know, um, I think yes, obviously they they do help us and they can help us to um, to understand. But I think that, that there is a sort of an important switch, which um, it's not always said that you know we might um, uh, we might notice it and we might start to understand what its impact is what is it that it's doing only in 10 years but i think that there is a you know this switch had you know happened long time ago it's not like now we're seeing the first outcomes and i think it's quite relevant for 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 us to think what does this mean also for the left what does it mean for um uh, for doing politics on the left you know yeah. well yeah i mean you know the the brexit vote Okay, the Sanders vote, like some of these political dynamics actually show that the generational divisions, which are not necessarily classed divisions, uh, show and indicate a very insidious form of resentment within the generational problem. Um, there's obvious dangers to uh, weaponizing generational politics as your privileged mode of analysis, just as anti-elitism is problematic they both fall into the same uh, danger i would say yet at the same time the the effects are extremely real i mean the fact that now i'm 40 when i go to the the socialist uh groups here in the united states the dsa i'm doing some political education with them i'm i'm the oldest person there yeah okay um which i'm fine with but it indicates this thing which itself is only conceivable by political economy and you know various very specific uh, choices that were made uh in the neoliberal era to exacerbate these differences um because that's the new basis of the of the social contract which is this kind of split fragmented antagonistic divisive anti-solidarity the only way you can mobilize people is through resentment now. And the powers that be have such a sophisticated means for pushing communities of resentment. Let us actually shift to a question of Nietzsche. As a great Lukacian scholar yourself, <laughs> I, I, I know, I know that you are that you have a particular reading of Nietzsche. I want to say for the benefit of listeners and viewers, you all know my views on Nietzsche. Tiana and I share a kind of uh, solidarity on this. Can you can you tell us the symptom or maybe some of the problems with Nietzsche, with Nietzscheanism, in your opinion? Uh, what what is what is Nietzscheanism? Uh, it's very difficult to answer what is Nietzscheanism. Uh, 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 certainly, yes, you could say on the one hand that there is at least within academia, a big fan club of Nietzsche, and hence you could call it uh, uh, Nietzscheanism in the sense of some uh, uh, um, um, 
fans of Nietzsche. Uh, but I think ultimately, and this is this is the biggest problem uh, 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 with Nietzsche. Obviously, I would advise people to read Lukács, to read uh, uh, Domenico Losurdo themselves, because I think that nothing can, you know, can 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 replace the experience of reading these books. Um, um, although, then again, and, and go, read Nietzsche himself. I mean, you obviously, know, you, I mean, you obviously. have to you have to go to the source. Obviously, mm -hmm. and to go back to your question, you know, the question of the uh, viewpoint uh, uh, Marxism to, to to the question of Weltanschauung. So. Yes, there is obviously, you know, you, you can go and read, uh, need, you can read Losurdo, you can read Lukács and not be changed by that reading, you know, because you hold a different view. There are many people who think that, you know, the readings of Lukács and the readings of Losurdo are uh, vulgar. Um, and many Nietzscheans use this quite often as an attack, you know, that they failed to understand this, that they misunderstood that, that they failed. Um, but my biggest problem with, yes, everyone, I mean, who? I mean, all of us, when 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 we were, you know, uh, uh, um, very young people studying philosophy, yes, you read Nietzsche, you read Sartre, you read Camus, you know, Camus, you, you read all of these people and you're like, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, fascinated. But then when you start thinking uh, and reading some other things, because, you know, you start discovering worlds outside of this, um, but I think today that the biggest danger of Nietzsche uh, uh, and Nietzscheanism is the ability or it, that it leads rather to the inability, to inability to think politics outside of um, a very uh, relativistic, uh, relativistic conception, which at best can end in some forms of superficial Foucauldianism and the recognition of the permanent conflict of forces, which finally then is, you know, translated into some or other form of Schmittianism. And I think that this is the biggest, that this is the biggest problem with Nietzsche. It is precisely the idea that this philosophy, which um, doesn't appear to have anything political in it, you know, when you read Nietzsche, when you take his um, writing almost like a poet, you know, and you think, well, there can't be anything wrong in this this is really beautiful yes the aesthetic experience can be you know gratifying it can be beautiful it can be great but the lesson of philosophy is that philosophy is also related it is also a task of interpretation and task of interpretation is not simply taking Nietzsche and you know seeing what Nietzsche uh, uh, writes in one particular text it is also a task of putting this text into a wider historical context. In other words, we're doing the political economy of Nietzsche, not in the vulgar sense, but simply trying to understand where he comes from, the time that he lives in, and the things that he's arguing for or against. And then, you know, his philosophy necessarily has to give um, a different a different kind of view. But I think, you know, moralism, apoliticism, and ultimately, you know, siding with the idea of you know of, of forces and of the logic friend enemy are the biggest dangers actually of, 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 mm -hmm. of philosophies of mm -hmm. internalizing and accepting uh Nietzsche as your philosopher or Nietzscheanism as something that you uh, uh that you choose uh, uh uh I think these are the biggest actually challenges for anyone who um who who considers themselves to be a Nietzschean yeah all right so I want to shift to our final topic and we're currently dealing with a other geopolitical nightmare of russia's invasion of ukraine and currently uh this is uh, not looking good at all and it is personal to you given your you know experiences with nato your experiences the balkans and i want to invite you to just tell us how you're feeling right now about this uh, this tragedy and what what you what you see as um, uh, the most important things that people uh, should be should be thinking about when they're looking at, at this this tragic event unfold. Uh, okay, um, first of all, yes, it is it is it is kind of um, for the left uh, again a big lesson. But then let me let me. Let me begin by saying this. Yes, the intervention of the NATO at the same time, you know, Balkans is 
at the crossroads of, you know, in particular, for example, if you take Bosnia, the Western capital, the Russian capital, the Arab capital. So there are, you know, there is the um, mixing of very, very complicated, uh, complicated geo strategic and geopolitical, geopolitical moments. However, um, I do want to say, and not simply, uh, or precisely because, rather precisely because I have lived through a war uh, as a child, although I was already starting high school when the war had ended. So, it, you know, it's, 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 the war is a very complicated thing. Um, um, and precisely because I have lived like a refugee um, today as a socialist, I think that one has to obviously, first thing, condemn the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That is the, you know, the, the first position that one has. On the other hand, um, one has to condemn the position of NATO. So in other words, the position of socialists cannot be the one of criticizing Russia, pure and simple, precisely because the conflict in Ukraine, like all other wars, amongst other things, um, are not always, you know, strictly related to anyone who thinks, in other words, that the war started yesterday is completely wrong. The invasion is to be condemned. But from my experience as a refugee, it's precisely because of this that I want to say that, you know, there is the irreduc irreducibility of the experience. And, you know, this is why we can't found a philosophy on this kind of, you know, experience, subjective experience, subjective positions. Someone else's experience from Bosnia and the same war might be completely different to mine. And this is not a position that the left has to take. And hence, yes, condemning Russia and, you know, the Russian invasion, but stopping there is precisely stopping short of going, of understanding this properly, that is dialectically. And that is, if we fail to understand that is, this is also related to the other side of the geopolitical uh, curtain, as it, uh, which is the NATO, then we completely fail to understand what's actually happening. Um, I dislike the idea, and I don't consider myself at all to be an expert, neither on Russia, nor on Ukraine, nor on the Balkans for that matter. And if anything, um, I maintain a position um, particularly if you look at the academia, and these have all been historically forms of acquiescence to the various uh, kinds and forms of the identity politics. So if you look at this, um, um, for example, it's women who write about women. Black people write about black people. People from Middle East write about people from Middle East. Uh, people from uh, uh, Russia write about Russia. People from the Balkans write about Balkans. So academia is at the same time and the expertise, I mean, not always and not necessarily, but it's related to, um, you know, you become like a, a, an internal spy, snitch, an internal provider. I understand, yes, there is the problem of knowing the language and then uh, 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 in order to be able to follow certain things and to write certain things and to pronounce yourself seriously, yes, you do have to know the language, you have to know the history. There is obviously this problem, but there is also the problem of the acquiescence that we've all been accepting. And that is that, you know, um, um, you as a Russian have to, you, you're an expert on Russia, for example, you know, or you're a you know, physicist, mathematician, but mostly you are into area studies. And the whole area studies thing, you know, is a very much child of Cold War. And this is something that I would also uh, sort of bring into question within the academic sort of world, but okay. Um, what I do want to say is that as principled socialists, what we do have to say, and we've seen this, and it's really, you know, it's blood curling, curdling, sorry. It is awful, uh, the coverage of this war that we have seen. War in itself is terrible. Like anyone, like any reasonable person, obviously, uh, like any principled socialists, what we demand are the immediate aggressive negotiations and immediate withdrawal of Russian troops from the Ukraine. But on the other hand, we cannot demand that our internationalism be that of the NATO. You know, that's that's so that leaves us in a where does that leave the I mean the 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 kind of liberal super ego is uh, uh, fierce right now, and I am uh, sensing. It's uh, 
to 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 hold this position that you are that you are suggesting um it's very difficult daniel and i think it's going to be even more difficult because even before this and let me say that this is really you know um 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 we all went to bed one night the next day we woke up with the threats of the nuclear war apart that i think that obviously this was a response to um the western um sanctions uh, introduced against against russia and hence you know putin had to had to respond to this in some sense but what we are looking and i think in in some sense the ukrainian war indeed is the first is historic in one thing you know it is not historic that in that it is a war we've had invasions the western invasions of iraq of you know libya of syria uh, we've had the bombing of belgrade so we've had the western interventionist logic rule for quite some time things are very much complicated because we see again in particular in the liberal center everywhere from western europe to uk to united states the mainstream media are almost normalizing the possibility of an atomic conflict and i think this is a very dangerous moment i think that what we have seen in the last couple of days everywhere without exception in the western world is that for the first time in history we have a movement for peace which is actually calling for war and i think that this is very very much a precedent that's the first precedent the second precedent is that this is um a first war which is actually also at the same time an expression of politics as cancel culture because contemporary politics is in fact cancel culture so what we have been seeing the coverage of the war is extremely racist you know we've all heard the ukrainian deputy uh, uh, of the um, uh, former deputy of the chief prose- state prosecutor saying they're killing white people with blue eyes and blonde, blonde hair he himself having brown eyes and bl- uh, brown hair but fine we have heard stories of african students who are stranded at the polish border stranded and not allowed to cross the border like all other ukrainian people are we have heard about portuguese citizens of a wrong skin color being stranded at the polish border not allowed to enter we have seen for the first time the european union activate an in in uh, unlimited number of refugees that europe is going to take well until yesterday no one knew that there was an unlimited number of refugees clause available you know for the african people for for people coming from that is the nato refugees if you want to call them so we, what we've seen is yet again the hypocrisy um countries destroyed by nato wars the entire middle east african countries so they the people from ukraine are called refugees which they indeed are there is a war happening but people from countries destroyed by nato are called migrants and for them we have walls we have tortures on the border we have rapes we have you know permanent limbo that they're not allowed to enter the european union we have real and true you know one should not be afraid to call it racism and this racism is the expression of the most vile western ideology and it is interesting how literally overnight the entire world has sided with the western ideology when you listen to biden and he's saying we're going to hobble their economy we're going to make russian people pay dearly we're going to make these are not the first sanctions obviously iran has suffered se- severe sanctions venezuela has suffered severe sanctions um uh, uh uh cuba has suffered severe sanctions so these are not sanctions first sanctions but they are this is the first war where we are seeing not just the cancellation of the the attempts to to fight russia militarily but we're seeing cancellation of russian citizens we're seeing russian paralympics team cancelled from uh, uh 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 from competition we're seeing ballerinas this morning i read the news that the german deutsche uh, gemeinsam uh, forschungsstelle uh, uh their uh, the um so the german state body that is offering scott they're not doing uh, any cooperation with russia anymore uh, people at the institutes institutes across western europe who hold russian passports have been um uh, have been pushed out basically in italy they are you know they've tried banning the uh, course on dostoevsky and then the university decided to reinstall the course about dostoevsky on the condition that it has to be accompanied with one ukrainian writer which is just a total you know acquiescence to the worst 
liberal nonsensical hysterical politics obviously yes russia is to be condemned but does it mean that our internationalism now takes the form of cancel culture where we cancel russian people as such and let me remind you that you know many people in these western institutes and universities who are now cancelled or who other people are asking to be cancelled are those same people who actually were opposition to putin and we are punishing the anti-war movement in Russia who is working under extreme oppression, under extreme circumstances, in a very, 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 under a dictatorship, you know, mm -hmm. because, you know, Putin had changed the constitution and given himself the rights to be the president for, for the entire life, which de facto means that they're living under a, you know, a real, real dictatorial regime. And this is how we are responding to these people. And there is something utterly perverse. I'm saying these are not the first sanctions, but it, it, in, in a matter of very soon, you know, Russian people won't be able to buy bread. And watching the pleasure of liberal hysteria in, that's also a form of imperialism, one should say. Yeah. That. It's also a form of imperialism. It's also, but the perverse enjoyment in this idea that we can now punish them this way, yeah, yeah, that we will make Russian citizens pay dearly, yeah, is terribly frightening. Well, yeah, and then 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 there's the um, I mean, it's all it's all a kind of nominalist fantasy, and it's um, you know, it is why I think some of these psychoanalytic theories of ideology actually do do uh, are quite instructive. The way it's going to play out domestically in the United States is that it is going to completely delegitimize Donald Trump, given that Donald Trump has said all of these positive things about Vladimir Putin. Um, so you have that dimension. But you also have that dimension of American politics falling into the circus, this kind of Roman Empire circus of a, of a total fantastical spectacle of these kind of kind of political conflicts so de-rooted, so de-linked from material, true antagonisms that the people experience day in and day out, that it is just uh, 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 depressing to see it unfold. And I, I, I do fully agree with everything you've said. And I hope that listeners take what you're saying intellectually uh, to heart. And I want to... Um, just one more thing, uh, Daniel, please, because please. I think it's important for the left, in particular uh, uh, in Europe. And, you know, we've recently seen the uh, FT. I mean, whatever you want to say about the FT, the, uh, you know, um, they are, their analysis are usually, well, I, I, I don't the know. Only, the only bourgeois press that doesn't lie, according to Lenin. Well, uh, um, uh, let's say that their analysis are, in a way, you know, trustworthy to some extent. But you have seen... Uh, 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 the article, because you know that in in the UK, twelve uh, Labour MPs, so the left, uh, 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 the left Labour MPs have signed the letter of the coalition, stop stop the war coalition, condemning both uh, Russia and NATO, and that Keir Starmer had basically forced them to withdraw their uh, signatures, and in less than an hour they did so. But what's interesting is that even FT had published an article presenting Starmer as this, you know, uh, a fearless leader marching forward. There is an image, he and his closest uh, 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 um, closest uh, uh, um, colleagues, or I don't know what you call them in, in, in English, but anyway, his cabinet, let's say. Um, and it is terrifying because they have called these people the supporters of Putin. And this is important for the left because we are living, as I said, in a time when for the first time we have a, peace movement, which is actually asking for war, and it, in huge parts of the world, in, in, in Europe, on the continent in particular, um, in that sense, the Italian and the German prime minister speeches were really chilling. I mean, really chilling and everything that's happening, it's quite relevant. And even before this, we have seen an immense squeeze of the democratic space, not just for the left, but for any kind of opposition to the status quo. And I think it's going to be very difficult for the left in the time ahead of us. Very, very difficult in continental Europe, definitely in the UK, certainly because there is an enormous pressure and enormous squeeze that anyone who is criticizing NATO 
and the Western alliance and the general militarization of the world that we are witnessing, it is an unprecedented militarization that we are now seeing, I think it's going to squeeze the space for the left even more. And it's going to be really difficult. But this does not mean that the left should bow down and that the left should say, that the left should acquiesce and that the left should say, yeah, NATO is great, Russia is terrible. Because this is precisely the construction that we are seeing of the enemy where, you know, yesterday was Saddam that was barbarian. Uh, uh, first, it was, let's say, Slobodan Milosevic that was barbarian, uh, that was the new Hitler. You know, the West had said this for uh, 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 when they invaded Egypt in 1956. So Nasser was, uh, uh, um, he was Hitler. Then later, Slobodan Milosevic was the new Hitler. Then Saddam Hussein was the Hitler. Then Gaddafi was Hitler. They even said Gaddafi would attack European cities. And now we have a, you know, warmongering machinery saying that Vladimir Putin is the new Hitler. Um, I don't want to be pessimistic, but every time that the NATO alliance or the Western alliance, the West here is more crucial than simply saying NATO, it's the West because this is the Western ideology. Every time they have said that there was a Hitler outside of Europe, it ended in, in invading these countries. Obviously, I don't think that with Russia, the possibility in the same way exists. I think that it is just important to understand that within uh, 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 these circumstances and within this conjuncture, it is going to be very, very difficult for the left to uh, uh, um, to criticize uh, uh, militarization, to criticize NATO and to criticize the Western ideology. But now is the time precisely to do it because uh, I think that the left begins only where hypocrisy ends. So we can't say, oh, uh, it is. It's terrible. You know, what Putin is doing is awful and it's terrible. And we all agree, you know, the basis of negotiations, which we hope will start sooner rather than later, is Russia withdrawing its troops from, from Ukraine, obviously. But on the other hand, we cannot accept that certain refugees are more acceptable because they come as the Slovenian. I mean, the official state institutions and the prime minister of, say, Bulgaria had said this because they come from... Um, uh, uh, they're culturally European. And let me tell you, the West Europe never, ever will think, nor does it think, that the Eastern Europe is Europe. We are guilty of the unforgivable crime that is communism, and never, ever, even when, you know, countries become part of the European Union, we are never considered to be, we're always, you know, suspect. We're always suspects precisely because we are the bearers of the unforgivable sin and this unforgivable sin is communism and in this sense there is the ideology of westernization which people need to understand is quite effective and that it works you know from lithuania to bosnia the recipe was the same aggressive mm -hmm. neoliberalism in politics presented as political pluralism from one party system to you know political pluralism aggressive neoliberalism in economy and the most violent aggressive historical revisionism of the cold war type mm. and based on anti-communism and on anything merely resembling the left and this has been the process of the ideological so-called westernization in the former eastern europe mm. you know mm. Mm, and it's mm. quite relevant because in 1989, the whole Eastern, you know, the, the, the whole Eastern Europe was called Eastern Europe. Then there was a change. Then there was the Central Eastern Europe. So the, the certain countries became Central Eastern Europe. Now the countries, for example, Croatia is part of the European Union and Bosnia, Macedonia, Albania and Serbia, they're called the Western Balkan countries. So from in less than 20 years from uh, Eastern Europe, we became the West. The, the the European official ideology has changed, you know, as the accession moved more towards the East and, you know, they were becoming, as it were, the West based on the same recipes, as I said, you know, aggressive neoliberalism, aggressive historical revisionism, very dangerous, very, very, very dangerous because it is extremely not only polarizing to the society and not only uh, uh, does it mean that any left position is a priori because the, the foundations of the state are very anti-left and anti-communist. Mm. So the same forces mm -hmm. that have defeated historical fascism and Nazism mm. are being mm. presented as mm. the problem. Mm. Mm. Very, very, very dangerous. But it's also the fact that in 20 years from East, 
we became the West. So today we're called the Western Balkans, which simply sort of discloses fully the teleology of Europe, that Europe can only be realized in the West. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have to be West, Mm. because West is the best. And the Mm. victory of this ideology in all of this is actually what's going to pose serious threats for for the left. But Mm. the left should not, you know, renounce its internationalism and its internationalism cannot be NATO Mm -hmm. and must not be NATO. Mm. Mm. Bravo. Um, Wow. Uh, Well, we... just want to thank you for you, you know, coming on the program and um, sharing all of these just incredible insights. Um, I'm going to link to your page so people can can learn more about what Tiana has written about all of these incredible questions around feminism, around Marxism. Um, soon, hopefully, we'll be publishing your paper at the Lukács conference. Um, and can you maybe mention in, in conclusion? where folks might, uh, where, where you might like to uh, tell people a little bit more about your work, or maybe even mention uh, some new kind of projects of, of your own research or of your own political activism, et cetera, that you're, that you're up to in, in, as a final uh, send off? Uh, I mean, I, I, I dislike the idea, as I said, you know, um, I'm a philosopher. I work mainly within the uh, area of political philosophy. I'm currently working on many themes related to particular Lukács, in particular Lukács, and also um, uh, I'm working on um, 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 on a text um, about Hegel and Hegel's conception of the uh, uh, family within the mm. um, uh, philosophy of um, philosophy of right. Mm. Um, it's, you know, what I've been doing currently. I also consider myself to be a uh, militant because I dislike the word activist. I prefer the word militant to activist because activism presupposes no teleology, whereas I think militant presupposes a, a, a bit, you know, more serious approach. And I am a militant of the uh, Balkan left, so I don't consider myself, although I'm originally, I am from Bosnia, I was raised in Bosnia. Uh, uh, um, I don't consider myself to be um, uh, Bosnian because I think that, you know, socialists in that sense have no country. And I consider my uh, beliefs to be internationalists um, in the real and proper sense of that word, as, as, as you know, the old left used to think about it. And I think that um, the main thing that, that you know, uh, should drive us all uh, and, and the left is actually uh, thinking about the um, um, mutual aid and solidarity and exchanging our own uh, uh, experiences of struggle, our own experiences of organizing and the ways that we can and should work together because um, capitalism as a system is still here. So it is obsolete to say that we no longer need, uh, so it is impossible, that is to say, that we no longer need Marxism. And again, I would like to end with something that Jameson said, uh, um, an interesting observation almost 20 years ago, that every time that we are in a such a massive crisis of capitalism as we are today, and this imperialist uh, uh, um, uh, war and wars that we are seeing across the world, because one shouldn't forget, and this is also something that is relevant, uh, uh, the focus, and that's also the ideology of escalation, because now the focus is on Ukraine, whereas there are wars happening and the populations of Yemen are being bombed, the populations of Somalia are being bombed, there is a war in Syria, Iraq is in complete mess, total mess, so there are wars around the world, there are countries around the world which are under the sanctions by the West, and I think that the left should think these as part of one and the same global problem of inter and intra-imperialist competition, because without this, the War seems simply as something that happened uh, like this suddenly, rather than seeing it as a an outcome of long term processes within the capitalist production processes, without the uh, with, within the capitalist expansion, without the, uh, with the within the intra imperialist competition. And in this sense, Jameson warns us that you know when capitalism is is in big and deep crises, as we are seeing now, there is always an idea, and someone always appears and says, oh, post-Marxism. There is no post-Marxism because capitalism is still very much alive. All right. Tiana, my friend, 
comrade. It's been an honor to sit down with you today. And I know that our viewers and listeners are really going to appreciate everything you've said. So be well, and uh, we'll, we'll have you on again soon. I just wrote a book on the family. So we need to have a, a follow up conversation on that precise topic. But thank be you, well. Dan. And thank you. thank you. Bye, everyone.